Hello. It's the 29th of April, 2016, and this is episode 50 of the Unseen Podcast. We've been podcasting for just about a year now. I'm pretty happy that we got to 50 episodes in that that span of time. And this is your host, Paul Carr. And joining me tonight are, for the first time, Sam Lichtenstein. Hello, Sam. Hello. Congratulations on episode 50, Paul. Thank you. Now, Sam Lichtenstein, who is Sam Lichtenstein? Uh, so I live in Hong Kong. Um, been a fan of the show for the last 10 or 15 episodes whenever I started listening. Uh, and since this, uh, this week, we'll be talking about forecasting and predictions. That's something I've been interested in the last few years and have been doing professionally to some extent because I work in finance trying to predict financial markets. I uh, figured I would join you for this, this go around. Great. So it's good to have a pro once in a while. Uh, and we also have with us tonight Adam Smith. Hi, Paul. Hi, nice Adam. Nice to be back once again. And Adam's in the UK, as you probably remember, and it's what, three o'clock in the morning there? It is. Yeah. Uh, so thanks for joining us, Adam. Uh, and it's a pleasure. Now, uh, tonight, as, as Sam just mentioned, we are talking about our rela- relationship with the near future. Last last time, two weeks ago, as you know, probably know, we're on a two-week rhythm now. Uh, we talked about our relationship with the long-term future. What would we put in a time capsule? How would we like to communicate with people thousands of years or millions of years from now? In this episode, we're going to stick to the closer future, even things that might be in our, our own lifetime, or maybe just a little bit beyond that. Um, I'm 58, so for me, my I, my horizons maybe 20, 30 years, depending on progress in medicine. Uh, You're maybe, quite pessimistic. <laughs> maybe 40 years if, if uh, um, well, you know, I, I have bad habits, guys. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, anyway, uh, what I'd like to... Uh, talk about tonight is our attitude towards how we look out towards the near-term future and how we try to understand it and some of the recent advances in the near-term, in understanding the near-term future. This started when I read the book Super Forecasting by Philip Tetlock and uh, that started when I, I heard Tetlock appear on Julia Goleff's podcast, um, Rationally Speaking, last fall. And Tetlock came on and, and mentioned that there were people who were super forecasters. I said, oh, there, is ac- there are actually a group of people with superpower. They can look into the future. Well, <clears throat> of course, it's not really a superpower. You know, uh, I... I don't want anybody to think that we're talking about magic, but there are people who are better than others at looking into the near-term future, not the long-term future. Um, so, I don't know. Uh, guys, how far ahead can we look in the future and still have any confidence at all that we're just not completely making things up? So, I mean, would... Go, on, go ahead, Adam. Uh, I was just going to ask a a follow-up clarification. What do you mean by uh, any confidence at all? It means like better than random chance? Better than better than science fiction. (laughs) (laughs) I would argue that we can, in fact, look all the way into the future, the far future, with one hundred percent certainty. We know the future of the universe as a whole. The universe is going to die. The long-term future. Yeah. The okay. But that that now now Adam, the I man the ground yeah. rules the ground rules are you know 
a human lifetime or something like that. Yeah. Well, let, let's make that distinction. So, yeah, to counter Adam's point of view, I'll say I think the, the barrier for useful predictive ability is somewhere around five years. Yeah. Now, would that be now? Is that broad strokes or is that anything? I mean, let, let's say you know we people like uh, someone whose name would may take in vain a few times tonight is Robin Hanson, and he, he you know he looks into the future and he says, well, the economy's doubling every fifteen years or something like that, and that's that's a trend that will continue for a while, then it will change, but uh, or, or are we talking about specific events? Well, certainly for for broad patterns. So, like, I would say I think demographers are very confident about what the trajectory of, say, the American population will be, and maybe even the global population for the next fifty years. C certain some things are easy to predict, but those things tend not to be the most interesting things to predict. Right. Well, but I mean, I mean. I mean do, have demographers, do demographers have a good record of predicting global population? I, I'm not too familiar with the literature, but I, my understanding from what I've read is that it's, it's just not that hard. Basically, people have babies at a certain rate. Right. And you can predict but, that rate from, say, their economic development and a few other factors, and their babies will have babies at, this, at a similarly predictable rate, and so you can just extrapolate out the population from that. Right, but I mean, let's, let's, go, let's look back to the 60s and 70s, right? People were talk, looking at the population growth in Asia and saying, famine is certain, right? And that didn't happen, right? Uh, the, there was a Green Revolution, there was, there was and, and there's been a reduction in population growth in developing countries. <laughs> And so, some developing countries. Well, I mean, basically, women, in even the women who aren't becoming educated and and aren't getting you know the advantages of being in developing a developed country, are looking at developed countries and saying, "Oh, wow, those women have more time to themselves. Let's have fewer babies." And we are seeing lower fertility rates in in Africa and South America and other places like that. So I, mean, I don't want to get too di diverted onto that topic, but I mean, we we can really be wildly wrong about about uh, broad strokes like that, like how many babies people will have in thirty years from now. So I, I actually don't know what the demographers were saying in the sixties. Certainly, I, you're right that environmentalists in the sixties, like Paul Ehrlich, were uh, crying, do you know, saying the sky is falling. So I, it's always the question of whose predictions you're looking at, and yeah, it, it depends. The experts or the non-experts and can make a big difference. I think it makes an awful difference on uh, the person that's making the prediction that the political ideas, the vision of the future, is grounded in all sorts of uh, like someone with environmental concerns will make much more different predictions to someone who is a, a strong libertarian, say, interested in free market economics. Mm -hmm. Peak oil is another good example of this. Ah, uh -huh, yes. People were confidently predicting, but basically I would say no economist was predicting. <laughs> and that's probably still the case that many environmentalists still expect us to reach peak oil consumption relatively soon but probably very few economists expect us to, to do so. Yeah, I, I always thought the peak oil thing was a little weird. Uh, I mean, even even though, I mean, yeah, there is a finite amount of oil down there. Uh, the system adapts to how much petroleum is, is out there. For, in, in, with incredible agility, people will, will try to adjust to that, and markets will adjust to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The price of oil right now on the uh, international markets is very low. You know, I don't, I don't think many people would have predicted, maybe specialist economics experts might have predicted the price of oil correctly 
say, 10 years in the past. But uh, most people would probably have thought that oil would be much more expensive than it is today. But, you know, it's interesting about this. All these examples we've brought up of, I would characterize these as longer term predictions where we can still maybe say something interesting, although it's a little bit questionable how accurate we can be. They're all basically technology predictions. So in the, demography, in the demography case, it's, you know, the, the green revolution, the, the advances in agricultural techniques introduced in India that prevented famines. And the peak oil example, it's, uh, it's basically 10 years ago, would you have predicted how big fracking would have been? You know, that's, no. that's the driving supply side factor, at least for the United States oil market. Maybe it's different over there in the UK. But um, I, I, I wouldn't have known what fracking was 10 years ago. Nor did I. I, so nor did a, I. Yeah. Yeah. It was, I think, only a couple uh, very, uh, very rich. They're now very rich guys in Texas probably knew what it was back then. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and now the U.S., Last I checked, was now exporting as much, uh, was now a net exporter of oil, uh, whereas we were, were an importer not long ago. I don't know the, the import export numbers, but I know that we have surpassed Saudi Arabia production. And yeah, which, you know, it, if you look at what you want to get done for CO2 uh, production, is not a good thing, but. Uh, uh, Except insofar as the uh, natural gas harvested from fracking processes displaces coal power production. Uh, good point. Good point. Um, now, what, I apologize. What, I just got this video call from you guys. Um, I, I didn't expect to get a video call. Okay, uh, so, uh, Patrick, uh, you got an invitation, uh, but we're recording now. Hello, Patrick. Hello, Adam. I, I, um, um, I, I actually got that, that ringing sound. Okay, we're going to move on. Patrick, we're talking about predictions, okay? Uh, and uh, we're, the price of oil was the most recent topic. But may, maybe to bring it back to Tetlock a little bit, you know, his original interest in this subject was on a slightly shorter time horizon uh, in terms of, like, geopolitical events, wars, and dictators and things like that. Yeah, I think he came to, uh, he, he got into the idea of uh, forecasting through uh, the US intelligence community. Uh, they were the, the people that sponsored him to uh, host the forecasting tournaments that he uh, developed, uh, what, from a, I think he started them around 2011. Well, it was IARPA, the uh, Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Association, that won these tournaments. Yeah. And uh, and why was that? Well, uh, there were some major intelligence failures, and you know we all know what the biggest one was. Uh, that that was the thinking that Saddam Hussein had major weapons of mass destruction in his possession and was ready to use them. Uh, <laughs> was that in it? Was that a failure of intelligence or was that just a blatant lie? I think it was mostly a failure of intel or, you know, you could talk about maybe there was a lot of self-deception, but I believe the intelligence community really thought that was, that was there. At least the yeah. se senior people in the intelligence community. Now, you know, we could, People tend to believe their own bullshit, you know, but. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, certainly there were complaints that there was a bypassing of traditional analysis techniques that went into that evaluation. And so you could say that historically the Central Intelligence Agency, other intelligence agencies have developed sets of techniques where, you know, low level analysts will read the, you know, messages from spies or whatever, you know, the, the raw intelligence, analyze it compile it up, passed up the ladder in a chain of chain of command. And what's, what's supposed to emerge from this is an accurate picture of the world. And one complaint in the wake of the invasion of Iraq was that that, uh, that pr procedure was bypassed. 
yeah, uh, resulting in a less accurate evaluation. Right, and but also, you know, nine eleven, right? I mean, that that was an intelligence failure. I mean, there were people who kind of understood that there was something going on, but their information never got to the top, and uh, as a result, it was a complete surprise to the executive level. Uh, and well, everybody knows what happened after that, but the, yeah. But so, so to return briefly to the question of you know, on what horizon can we usefully predict the future? One of the first, I mean, th this sort of falls into the related uh, topic of the instability in the Middle East. One of the first predictions I remember making when I got interested in this was in 2011, I believe, maybe 2012, about how long Bashar al-Assad would remain in power. Now, uh -huh. I guess you could question whether he even is still in power, but he certainly remains nominal head of the Syrian state. Right. And, in 2012, that seemed, it really seemed impossible for me to imagine that he would remain in power even another year. You know, there was this huge civil war going on in Syria, but Keep every them. year yeah. he's just been hanging on. And so this is why I don't think it's possible to really predict geopolitical events. Given what happened even, in Libya with Gaddafi and in Iraq with uh, Saddam Hussein, it is surprising example, that, yeah. that he has. Uh, managed to cling on to power in Syria, but now in, in order to in order to conduct an interventionist foreign policy, you've got to be able to look ahead and say, "Well, this is what will happen if we do this, right?" And uh, whether it's evading Iraq or bombing in Libya or whatever, and yet or we don't do that very well. But uh, nor does anybody else, though, right? The Soviets' right. invasion of Afghanistan sort of went went similarly, right? Or their their war against uh, the Chechens, or uh, and who knows what's going to happen? And so, so we have this this uh, this crying need to be able to look ahead just a few years and say, you know. What's given X? What's going to happen with Y? And uh, it's not it's not completely met. So the intelligence community has been, uh, to their credit, has has asked the question of how can we get the, make this better. And yeah, uh, I think the big uh, thing I, I watched the podcast that you mentioned earlier with uh, Philip Petlock is. Uh, ideas about super forecasting mm -hmm. um, and one of the the things he says is that some people are very good at forecasting some things making predictions that do pan out some people are better than others and he can there are techniques for identifying those people and uh, i like the idea that he's developed of uh, Using a numerical ranking of predictions. Yeah, the so-called Breyer score, right? Which yeah, goes back it, it, goes back to weather forecasting, which was something we were talking about earlier. Uh, you know, the uh, <laughs> the 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 Breyer score is a pretty simple thing. You just calculate um, how well somebody prediction does versus how confident they are in that prediction. Yeah, and. Well, he, uh, so people, look. people who are wrong and highly confident get the worst score, and people who are right uh, get the best score. And in between, you know, getting a score of about 0.5 isn't bad. Getting better than that is 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 much is really good. Uh, 2.0 is the worst score you can get. Yeah, on the that's bars. the uh, the chimp throwing a dart at a dartboard. Well, actually, the chimp throwing a dartboard does better than that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's the pun. It's, it's it's yeah. worth pointing out for um, listeners that the Breyer score is really just the you know if you predict something's going to happen with probability point eight, and it does happen, your score is uh, one minus point eight squared up to a some people multiply by two, and if it yeah. doesn't happen, it's zero minus point eight squared. Yeah. Or, uh, well, you have to add the, that to the, your probability that it won't happen. And then, you know, well, right, the, exactly. cla the classic it, prior. It's just, 
it's essentially just the squared error. Yeah, the, there's a, the old Briar score, and there's a, some people have developed a new one where uh, it's one, from zero to one. Zero to two, I right. think, is the one Tetlock uses. Uh, right, right. And which is the older, the older version of it. And uh, if but, you're to be get to two, you've got to be a pundit. <laughs> you can't just be a throw, a dart throwing chimp. Right, a dart throwing right, chimp is predicting the exact opposite of what's going to yeah. happen with perfect confidence. Yeah. Which would be like it's a slam dunk that Saddam has WMDs, right? Exactly. Yes. That that um, that's that's a two almost or very nearly two. But I should mention there's a whole family of other scores score function you you can use. They're called proper scoring rules. Mm-hmm. Basically, these these just have the the property that if somebody pays you or rewards you for your predictions based on uh, this scoring function. So they, they're, they're going to periodically ask you what, what your probabilities are for an event. And then after you know the outcome, they'll give you a payoff that's proportional to some score function. That's a function mm-hmm. of the outcome and your, your prediction. Um, so this is like a little game you could think about in the sense of game theory and economics. And a proper scoring rule is one for which this game incentivizes you to accurately report your best subjective estimate probability. So you can imagine certain certain payoff functions might not have that property, but if the score function does, then it's called a proper scoring rule. And the Breyer score is one example of a proper scoring rule. Now, that 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 sort of gives us a segue into prediction markets, right? I mean, uh, there people can actually get paid for making the making an accurate assessment of the probability of an event. Uh, so let's let's talk about uh, a very simple way how prediction markets work, right? It's you you get if if an event comes true and you buy the future on that event, you get paid a certain amount of money, right? And uh, so that that kind of like a horse race that price of that future will get bid up and down depending on sort of the aggregate assessment of what what that probability of the event is yeah it's clear as to just think about the payoff as a one you, you can scale it so that the reward if the event happens and you own a share of that event the reward is one dollar right. then the price in, is exactly the problem the price the fair price of, for that security is the probability of that event Okay, that's so, a good way to look at it. If, yeah. if, Hillary, if Hillary Clinton, right now, betting markets suggest she has a 95% chance of winning the Democratic nomination, and you can go to predictit.org and buy a contract that will pay you $1 if she gets the Democratic nomination, but you're going to have to pay about 90 to $0.95 cents for that contract. Mm-hmm. Well, so the Bernie Sanders contract is down around, what, uh, $0.05. Cents. And... Uh, so if you're if you're uh I'll take I'll take the loss. If you're a high roller, you you buy the birdie contract for five cents. You buy a bunch of them, and then there's a very small probability you'll you'll get you'll make a killing. Uh, at least on the at least so, that's the aggregate aggregate uh, notion. It, I should mention that that you know these are we've had real money prediction markets for a long time, they're called option markets right? on, on the stock, on stocks, you know, right. you can buy a contract that will give you a certain payoff. If the price of Microsoft stock goes above a hundred dollars or something. Right. And right. these have been very popular products created for hundreds of years. Right. So it's not really a new thing. Maybe the new thing is just applying it to a, uh, world events rather right. than. Well, I mean, uh, uh, something like the price of a Microsoft stock is a bundle of a lot of different, things going on at the same time, right? Right. Uh, what's going to happen in tech? What's going to happen with Microsoft management and lots of other things? Um, with their products, how well they'll, they'll sell into the tech market. But uh, specific, specific events are uh, what we're trying to do with prediction markets. Actually, we, I mean, what everyone's trying to do with the prediction markets is get a better prediction, right? It, by taking, mm-hmm. by peop, by making people have skin in the game, so they're not going to make a forecast unless they 
feel strongly that they have some idea what's going to happen. <laughs> and so you're eliciting their, their opinion with that, and then you're aggregating it with the price. So using the price to aggregate the expert knowledge. Uh, so if you say uh, Hillary Clinton has a high percentage of winning the Democratic nomination, you're getting a lot of people who are thinking hard about how likely that is, how many delegates she has, how many delegates she needs to win. And you know what what what's ahead, what's ahead in the near term future, and then uh, they're by their bidding and and marketing, uh, you know, matching up the the, the buyers to the sellers. You're you're aggregating their opinions. Mm. Is it easier to assign a, a probability to something that you think will happen than to assign a probability to something that you think won't happen? No, it's the same thing. Zero or one, right? Uh, well, it should be. It should be the same thing. But yeah. in fact, the psychology literature suggests that people did not think of it the same way. Uh, no, so I don't think they do. There's a so obviously betting on A to happen is the same as betting on not A not to happen, right? So it rationally it should be completely symmetrical. It should but be, yeah, but I, I don't think it is. In in fact especially for the very edges of the probability distribution, things that are very, very close to certain are very, very close to impossible. People seem to treat these things asymmetrically. Um, can there's I, a branch can of... A question. Um, okay, go ahead. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Oh, wait, I, mean, I, I should mention that Patrick Festa has joined us. Okay, go ahead, Patrick. Yeah, I, I got a video call and I, I answered. Uh, I'm not sure exactly if I'm interjecting here but in other words what if the people are you know talking about hillary clinton and bernie sanders what if the people are simply tired of the statistics that you're proposing and simply say that we're not gonna abide by those you know um, schools of thought and we're just gonna do what we do in other words is there is there a statistical thing that says that this, this, this doesn't abide by those rules. So if I understand your question correctly, correct me if I'm wrong. I think you're asking why should the market price reflect the actual probabilities? Like, for example, on the internet, there are a lot of Bernie bros who are super fans of Bernie Sanders. Let's, let's put me on a Bernie pro. Okay, I'm a Bernie pro. I, well, there's I'm, lots of them, especially Bernie. online. And so a lot of, I think, You'll notice that there's a, an upward price pressure from the popularity of Bernie among people who use the internet on these online prediction markets. It's a but, biased sample, in other words. Yeah, it's sort of a biased sample, but the market forces will still pressure the price towards the accurate value because if those people are overestimating the true probability, they're essentially giving free money away to anybody who's willing to take the other side of their bets. And so uh -huh. eventually, <laughs> people will... will decide, oh, I like the looks of that. You know, you think Bernie has a 15% chance of winning? No, no way. I'm going to sell there and collect well, that sense of, of, free, of free spread. That's free market economics for you. Right. And so that, this is a, there's a colleague, we mentioned Robin Hansen earlier, one of his colleagues at George Mason University Economics Department, which is kind of a very libertarian place, but um, one of them, it might be Alex Tabarrok, has a, a quote. He likes to say that a bet is a tax on bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> so you can believe whatever you want. You can give all the arguments you want, but until you put your money where your, your mouth is, it's meaningless. And if you do put your money where your mouth is, you have to be ready for people to collect, collect that money from you if you're wrong, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, I like that. <laughs> uh, it makes a lot of sense. So uh, now the prediction markets have been pretty good uh, aggregating expert opinion on future on near term future events um you know things two or three years away now part of the part of the reason we go near term is we want to be able to measure how good we are at predicting right and we don't want to we don't want to wait 30 40 years for that <laughs> we we want to do it you know within within uh whatever a reasonable number of years uh but the other the other thing is that uh in these competitions prediction markets have done pretty well but tetlock super forecasters have 
won the competitions. Uh, do you do you have anybody have an idea why why the for, super forecasters are better, or maybe or maybe if we combine the super forecasters in a market, they would be even better than that. Tetlock argues that the people that make the best forecasters are those that are able to adopt different points of view. That they're, they're more rounded thinkers, eclectic thinkers that yeah. cannot look at uh, an event or an issue from one political point of view, but can right. look at it from all points of view. The more open-minded, right? And the, maybe and it's the, worth it's worth clarifying what, exactly the claim Tetlock is making. He's not saying that any individual super forecaster is likely to beat a prediction market. That's right. What he's yeah. saying is, if you take an average of hundreds of super forecasters you who yeah. have been you know received certain training, you apply a certain statistical technique to aggregate their predictions, and basically it amounts to if if. 100 super forecasters are all about 75 confident, 75 percent confident in something happening. It's probably more than 75 percent likely to happen because they've arrived at that conclusion using independent lines of reasoning. So yeah, that, uh, when you use these sorts of aggregation techniques, he's found that the super forecasters are statistically superior to a, a prediction market baseline he used for comparison. I think that's because he. He views uh, super forecasting as, as a skill that can be learned and improved upon rather than uh, like an algorithm that you can just plug in and get an answer. Right. Well, I mean, these things are the kind of questions they were dealing with, the geopolitical questions are very complex to even represent in an algorithm. Uh, so, uh, you know, by the time by the time the computer scientists are done with the representation, the super forecasters have their answer. Uh, the super forecasters also update their answers a lot. Yeah, they, yeah, They're, they tend they're... to be obsessive about it. Yeah, <laughs> and, and and as Adam pointed out, they are not dogmatic. They are not invested in a particular answer. They want to know what the data are showing. And there's a number of other cognitive habits that they have that are discussed in Tetlock's book. I don't think I have time to go into, but they're they're basically they're not believers. They're no, I don't think they they're not people that have a higher IQ than uh, anyone well, else. They, they, in his book, he he mentioned that they have high they have good IQs, they're better than yeah, average sure. IQs, but they're not they're not geniuses. They're, they by tend to be numerate, probably more numerate than the, than the general population. Yes, they are numerate. Uh, they are smart, but they are not. You know, they are not Einstein's. They are. They are because they can, and that, this sort of allows them to to see <laughs> see things from multiple perspectives, which a genius might struggle with. They're probably also. I don't know whether Tetlock specifically mentioned this. There's certainly, I know he does mention the fact that they're disproportionately software engineers. And I would infer from that that they're probably disproportionately on the autistic spectrum without passing any judgment about that. I'm just guessing because it's correlated with being a software engineer. Um, well, maybe, maybe, although he, did, he, didn't, he didn't have any data about that in his book. Uh, but uh, It's my own speculation. <laughs> that, that, that's possible. Although, uh, again, you know, that's all good, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, people who are, who are, are, I don't, I don't like Nassim Taleb who wants to pass judgment on people who are, uh, are Asperger's. Uh, uh, so. Nassim Taleb is interesting to bring up in this context because he has his own sort of ideas about the inherent unpredictability of the future. Right. And I think he's kind of negative on prediction markets and, similar uh, forecasting tournaments, because he believes that you should ascribe so much weight to these really rare black swan events that planning based on, upon the market's best estimate of, of a probability is just going to lead you to shoot yourself in the foot. Like a, a stock market crash. Yeah, or a, a genetically modified organisms somehow sneaking out of the farm and taking over the world. That's the sort of thing he, he worries about, I think. Yeah, uh, he, he he's. I think he's kind of gone down the rabbit hole there, but 
I that, agree with you. That's my opinion, but um, I mean, he's one of these people that that probably is too smart for his own good. But uh, <laughs> he's a political scientist. Well, he's he's a, a very successful options trader. We should point out he did that for a long time, uh, and he's a mathematician, and he's and he's now a professor at NYU. But, yeah. Uh, he um he made a lot of money both writing books right with option trading and writing books about <laughs> why other people are bad at it uh and i've just been thinking about uh how the rise of supercomputers and uh the era of big data that we now live in plays into all of this are the computers gaining on people so that at some point they will become better at making predictions than people. Hmm. Well, I, I have some contact with people who do that sort of thing. I mean, I don't know myself, but uh, they are, they have to, they spend many years constructing very elaborate models that the supercomputers run. Yeah. Uh, yeah the models require a lot of repeatability in the phenomenon so for something like weather perfect right we we understand the physics of weather pretty well uh, we have a lot of data about weather about the atmosphere about the sun <coughs> and so forth all the inputs to the to the weather uh so yeah so there's no way that a human can beat a supercomputer at predicting weather no a, a computer won't cherry pick facts to suit uh, a prediction that they might have some sort of investment in. But you have to understand that there's, for every supercomputer running, there are hundreds of PhD scientists who are writing the code for that supercomputer to... Oh, of course, yeah. But, yeah. but I don't know if you know about this phenomenon. So no human can beat a computer at chess now, but a team of a, of a human who has access to several computers using chess engines can sometimes beat a straight up chess engine. Uh, it's called freestyle chess, where you combine, you allow humans to compete with one another with, with when they have access to multiple big computers running lots and lots of software. And I would suspect that in weather forecasting, it's the same, that if you take an expert human who knows about the ins and outs of the various weather models, and you give them access to as many models as they want, they will be able to adjust the predictions of whatever individual model they're looking at to make it more accurate. If, so if I may, if I may, because I'm, I'm somewhere of a chess player myself, um, there is a difference between weather predictions and chess playing. Um, I have all the Kasparov games on print and, and on, on uh, PGN files of, of the Deep Loop programs. He was perturbed at the time. But the fact is, is that uh, the brute force, um, you know, chess playing nowadays is the, the 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 chess software nowadays is being used as a uh, tool for grandmasters. Um, but weather prediction is a little bit different because we're talking about actual science, um, whereas chess programming has to do with. Uh, I, yeah, again, I'm not a programmer, so I'm, I'm, I may be a little bit lame on, on my explanation. Um, you know, it's it's about it's about the actual moves. In other words, uh, you have just so many moves. So you have programs that are actually using brute force, uh, but they've they've sort of dismissed those brute force programs uh, recently because uh, there's millions and millions and millions of moves, but they can actually dismiss uh, quite a number of them to be the best moves. Um, th my tablet, you know, cost me $100 at, at Walmart, can do more than what Deep Blue did uh, against Kasparov did uh, in 1990s. So in other words, there is a difference because in, in weather prediction, you're talking about actual science, trying to learn um, what the patterns are. Uh, there are, there are uh, multiple variables. There are, there are solar activities. There are... Um, um, Earth activities. There are, there are the El Ninos. There, I mean, there is a multiple number of variables. Whereas in chess, it is a game. 
it is a you know programmable game it is different i i, I don't see uh, yeah, I understand. There's there's sort of an, al- an analogy between the two things, but there is definitely um, a wrong analogy between the two. Um, um, when you're programming for chess, you are definitely programming something that you understand the game, and you're trying to get a computer to do the same thing that a human does. Whereas when you're trying to predict the weather, you are literally trying to predict random um, um, occurrences. Well, it's not random, right? It's you know oh, things are evolving according to certain partial difference equations that the computer is solving, right? Yeah, so I agree with you. It's very different from chess. All I was saying was that I could imagine the United States has some weather model, Europe has some weather model. They're both running on big computers. An expert might be able to say that European weather model is more accurate for modeling current flows in the Mediterranean, whereas the American weather model has has been fine tuned over the years to predict tornadoes in Oklahoma better. And so the, the, a human expert might be capable of combining inputs from multiple models and arriving at a more accurate conclusion overall, depending on what they're trying to predict. Yeah, and, and I agree with that. And, and uh, you know, the, the discovery of chaos, uh, a, a major step forward in chaos theory was the discovery that certain, we- certain pretty simple weather models uh, depended uh, entirely upon uh initial conditions and um the uh the so-called lorenz uh map came out of that and the mathematicians got a hold of that and figured out that there was a there's a whole field of things that were they were di- very difficult to, or almost impossible to predict um so you know it, now it's true in chess well, you don't know your opponent's thinking. You certainly do know uh, when you make a move what what the next what the board position will be. So uh, there is there is a, it's a little bit more deterministic, and and there's complete information. Whereas in weather, we only know we only get updates every few hours about you know what the temperature and pressure profile of the atmosphere. So and we only have a finite resolution of right. those data. Yeah, computers, computers deal with data, don't they? Whereas people deal with knowledge. Uh, uh, computers well, at the moment can't easily discern which data is useful. Well, that, that's why we write software, right? I mean, the software has has sort of converts data to knowledge. Uh, yeah, and it's done. It's done by humans. It, it's it's uh, you know when 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 uh, I mean, we get data from an from a from a weather instrument. It's just it's just a spectrum, or it's just a it's just a a count. But somebody converts that into a temperature and a pressure, and that's comes from the knowledge of the physics of how that data came about. And yes, there's error in it, and yes, it's not updated every second, and yes, it's uh, the resolution is not that great, maybe a few kilometers. Uh, if you're lucky, it may be tens of, more likely tens of, or even hundreds of kilometers. Uh, so, you know, when you're predicting weather, there are a lot of error sources. And, uh, but still, that they've been doing much, much, I should point out, they're doing much, much better in weather prediction. Uh, oh, yeah. You can now well, pre- predict the landfall of a hurricane a whole lot better than you you could 30 years ago. Well, the, worth point, the, point is, the point is that there's, there's a whole lot less variables uh, in chess than there is in weather. Yes, there are less. Um, fewer weather weather yes. is, is got an, uh, uh, almost, I don't want to say infinite, but there is a, a large number, um, almost infinite number of variables. Whereas in chess, um, you know, it's, there, is, there is just a finite number of moves. In other words, there is a difference well, between... But it's a computationally intractable finite number. A lot of cleverness had to go into the software in chess in order to prune the, the tree of possibilities to something that a computer can actually search. So there, yeah. in some ways, you're comparing two large numbers that are close to infinity for all practical purposes. Well, I, I'm, just saying, I'm just saying, like, in other words, because I, I, I'm a chess player, I, I understand the differences. In other words, there is, there is a lot of variables in weather. Um, there are there are solar activity. There are uh, earthly activities. Uh, you know, in 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 uh, 
um, El Nino and all this other stuff. There, there are there are a number of I, I I'm not I'm not an expert on this, so I'm just going to say that there are a lot more variables in predicting the weather than there are I in predicting that's, moves in chess. Yeah, that's certainly. Sam, true. can can you just briefly explain how someone would go about constructing a, an economic forecast? Uh, for what sort of economic forecast do you have in mind? Like for the, any anything you you care to think of. So uh, a good, how, how one interesting example from? is gross domestic product. So like the total amount of goods and services produced in the economy in a given quarter, say. Yeah. That's something people care a lot about. Markets tend to move when that number is released for a given country. Um, and so lots of people try to predict it. Um, so people but, will follow a number of different approaches. Um, the most common uh, in the econometric literature for that is what's called a vector autoregressive model, which is a fancy name. But what it amounts to saying is uh, you take a bunch of other things like inflation and unemployment and things that are measured recently, and you look at their values, you know, last month, the month before that, the month before that, maybe. And then you say that usually gross domestic, pro gross domestic product is some linear combination of those things plus last month's gross domestic product plus yeah. an error. And so you just calibrate that model by using ordinary least squares or maybe a slightly fancier uh, statistical technique and base your forecast off of that. Yeah. I think, I think the most accurate forca economic forecast I know for this is produced by the Atlanta Federal Reserve Bank. And they do something slightly trickier where they look at all the individual components of GDP, like industrial productivity, uh, exports, imports, they go to a fine grained level on but how the numbers are actually computed, and then they try to forecast each of those terms individually and use the most recent available data, and then they back out what GDP should be from that, and uh, they do a pretty good job. Is that information traded? I, the efficient uh, markets hypothesis implies that basically as soon as that information is available, it's immediately priced into the market's expectation of what GDP will be. Now, the markets, markets aren't really perfectly efficient, but to a first approximation, people trade on any, any individual bit of information the second it comes out, maybe yeah. in a microsecond. Can you, hey, uh, can you comment on the Black Shoals? Uh, oh, wait, wait, wait sorry. Uh, Mike Bowler has joined us. <laughs> Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, I wanted to, uh, since we're talking economics and predicting, uh, Black, the Black Shoals formula that's been used in arbitrage for, um, I've been studying this. I'm in try, actually trying, I, I, need to, I need to know more about how this thing's supposed to actually work, where supposedly you can look at two, um, um, two different uh, um, uh, investments, like, um, like, a, uh, like money market or money, like uh, the, like the U.S. dollar versus the euro, and if you can, you look at it and you say, okay, well, the the American dollar is overpriced, the euro is underpriced. So supposedly, under this Black Scholes rules or formula, that those two are going to merge at some point. So um, what you will do is, with um, U.S. dollars being high, you short it. You the uh, euro being lower, you go along with it, eventually the two prices will converge and that's your sell price. Kind of like a sounds kind of predictive, but I'm just wondering if you if you know anything about that. Is that that um uh, is that a, a, a again a, a a prediction model or is that just a uh, a mechanical something automatic? Because this seems to be um the, the Black Scholes model I would say is mostly a model that's for predicting the, uh, the the uncertainty in the price of something, like the the euro dollar exchange rate. Uh, basically, if you look at other products, other instruments like options that it, whose value depends on the price uh, on that exchange rate at some point in the future, the value of those options will depend on how uncertain the price that future exchange rate is. And so there's some market-based estimate of the uncertainty. Uh, and that's kind of, uh, Black-Scholes has to do with estimating, assuming the uncertainty is equal to what it, what it has been recently, how, how much the price has been moving up and down. 
what's the fair price for uh, for these options? That that's a question the Black Shoals model can help you answer. So it certainly is predictive. It's it's just of a slightly different flavor than the other sorts of prediction markets we've been discussing. Well, it's because my my research it seems like a lot of the I'm going to say some of the major financial disasters have been attributed to the Black Shoals uh, mid cap uh, uh, mid cap um, management. Yeah, they they, they lost billions. Um, the uh, uh, actually the uh, the 2000 2007 housing meltdown was also. Uh, yeah, it's so I would say it's not exactly the, the model itself that's a flaw. It's a question of applying the model blindly without being cognizant of the assumptions that underlie it. And in particular, a key assumption about in Black Shoals, say, for pricing options on a stock is that the stock price is a, a Brownian motion. So it's, it's moving around and the, the jumps are kind of random. And specifically, the random distribution they come from is something nice and normally distributed that doesn't have a. The key, this is related to what we were discussing with Nassim Taleb. Right. He's been uh, very critical of the Black Shoals. Yeah. Right. The point is actual financial asset prices move around with what's called a fat tail distribution, where big, big uh, crashes happen more often than you would expect if you modeled them as uh, Gaussian random variables. And that causes that can cause you to have unreliable predictions about uh, risk if you apply certain models blindly without taking that into account. Right. And fat, fat tails are real, right? I mean, uh, we get... Oh, it's a very, very prominent. If you, if you spend two minutes with the data, make plot a histogram, they, they pop up. It's just a very, very obvious feature of asset returns. Yeah, because the normal distribution per, uh, predicts an extremely low probability for anything, you know, just a few sigma out from the nor mean. And then uh, those things happen more, much more frequently than that. So. Yeah, there have been dozens of six standard deviation moves in the S and P five hundred in the history of of the financial markets. Whereas I think I don't have the numbers off the, off the top of my head. It's that's much more than you would expect from a Gaussian model. Right. I I just finished reading the uh, book, The Quants. Uh, all this, all the mathematical models that have been used in, uh, well, everything from Black Shoals to um, uh, the current uh, micro trading, computer micro trading, and um, anything economics. Anytime I talk to somebody about economics, I get a different story every time. I, I, it, that's that's if I, if I were to make. I mean, it, it seems like almost automatic. I get a different story, you know, about what this means, what Black Shoals means. So uh, this is another one, but uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm, it's interesting how the math seems to work. But I, I think I think you did answer that um, if you don't, if you, it seems like, um, like with the, the, the 2007 uh, meltdown, no one thought there was a downside. No one thought that the housing House pri home prices were going to fall, or you know that there was a there was even a housing bubble. You know they yeah. just thought they, they you know, and that seems to be the the key. There's um, somebody you know that it, it, the models work; they work really good. Um, I think until even, they don't. No, I mean I think that's the, that's the key difference with the the case of weather. We don't expect the laws of physics to change, so even though. The weather data is always changing. The rules for how the weather should evolve based upon that data, we think, are staying the same. But uh, economics, you know, anything that has to do with people changes all the time. <laughs> There's no corruption in clouds. <laughs> so it's a, it's a not, I guess, the statisticians would say economics is a more non-stationary system than physics. I'm interested in how governments at the moment are starting to apply the same kind of uh, forecasting and predictions to uh, intelligence and social trends. They're trying to apply the same kind of algorithms that economists use to predict future short-term future events like uh, 
wars breaking out or demographic changes. I, I think it's a, a good thing, a, a positive thing, but I, I'm not sure how successful it's, it's going to be. Time will tell, I guess. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, they've been so bad at it in the future, in the past, that, right? And, yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> that's why I'm pessimistic. But m might it become get weaponized somewhat? I mean, do you think that we could start using people? There'll be a race to get better prediction. So oh, definitely, that's definitely something that's happening right now across the world. I'm sure the Chinese are. are developing models to predict that you know their intelligence community are using forecasting models to predict what's going to happen in the south china sea exactly the same way as uh, the us government is uh, the japanese the australians the europeans i'm less confident about that i mean that's more of a game theory thing but i bet you're right that they're using forecasting models to predict um protests you know yeah like, sure based on What's happening on Weibo, yeah. Chinese Twitter? How likely is there to be a, a an uprising in Shenzhen? Yeah. Governments, case, you know, governments have begun to monitor social media, but for trends, I, you know, they they monitor keywords not only for uh, things like terrorism, but to try and predict uh, public opinion. Let me, ask, let, me ask, let me ask both of you a question, um, both, both you, Sam and Adam. What happens when the public uh, becomes aware of, of what you're trying to figure out and totally sort of throws a wrench in that, in that prediction uh, 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 scenario? Well, it's happening in Egypt right now, actually. There have been protests recently in Egypt. The current government learned from the revolution a few years ago, and now they scour Facebook. So people are switching to using encrypted instant messaging platforms that the government's not watching to, yep. to try to organize their protests. So I think yeah, you raise a good point. It's always evolving. And so that's why, even in this context, the predictive models aren't always going to, going to be reliable. The, the Chinese government have walled off their internet so that their internet is completely separate from the, the rest of the World Wide Web. So they can control what their population think and, and know about. Although the, the British government controls the BBC, so maybe, you know. Of course it does. <laughs> uh, uh, I'll be honest, my world view is based on what I hear on the, the, the BBC news every day. Is, mm -hmm. is... I like the BBC news. I, I think they, they, they uh, do a better job at uh, uh, here in the states, then yeah, of, of, uh, yeah, no, they're they're great. I was really trying to raise the point that it's all a matter of degrees. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not knocking the BBC either. I I like the BBC, but you know, I don't think they're perfect, but but they certainly do a better job in some of the some of the some not all, but some of the stations around here. Yeah, uh, but you can't yeah. eliminate bias in in reporting, especially political reporting. Yeah, yeah, I I I uh, I, I have a habit of listening to the BBC sometimes. Uh, and like you say, the BBC is a, a government, although the BBC is independent, it is a government funded institution. And uh, although they do clash quite often with the British government. They, well, you know what it is, you know what it is, um, I mean, I mean, even even if the, even if I disagree with them, um, they're at least at least they are outside of of what I hear from here. Like I'm in the United States, obviously. Um, um, uh, so, so they, at least they are separate from what we hear here. Um, and I, I, I totally, you know, uh, obviously I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I, I have a, a vendetta against Fox news and stuff like that, but you know, <laughs> BBC is not always the best, but nevertheless, they are actually outside of here. So, so I have a tendency to listen to them because I want to see what the outside list, what the outside has to have to say. One of my biggest disappointments with the internet is that people use it to 
post selfies and videos of kittens and it's largely used for watching pornography yeah, instead, I, I, instead of using it as a tool to learn <laughs> Don't yeah, ju- don't I, judge, Adam. Don't judge. No, I'm not judging. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm, I'm not going to go there because because I just recently had a, had a, had a recent. Uh, um, anyway, I'm not going to go there. My yeah, big let's hope, not go there. Yeah. <laughs> my, my big hope for the internet when it arrived in the the early '90s was that it would allow everyone who has access to the internet, which hopefully by this time I thought would be everyone in the world, which it plainly isn't i mean we 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 assume people that use the internet every day that everyone's on the internet but we are still a a small minority of people on the planet is that true i mean i don't really know how many people have access i i well i I tell you this i i you know i i i i'm i'm new here and and i just got a call and and, um i'm 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 honored to be on this uh, podcast but let me tell you something, Adam. Um, it's it's been a thing of mine to try to make Google Hangouts uh, a, a good thing, and there is. Uh, I, and so some of you may have seen my videos about the quote scumbaggery unquote that goes on um, in Google, and uh, I've been I've been promoting uh, Paul Carr's uh, uh, unseen podcast because of the uh, intellectual. Uh, um, um, content and stuff like that um, there is a problem there is a problem in this country and in, in, uh, you know I, I i'm i'm always trying to to show that that there is good to to come from things like google plus and things like that okay there is, there is but, a lot of scumbaggery on this but, you know that the, 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 the internet i expect to be always uh a bit crazy and a bit uh Never meeting anyone's expectations, but let's get back to predictions. Yeah, uh, so you, you, somebody had raised the question of whether governments could be using uh, sort of prediction markets or other techniques to develop predictions about what's going to happen, say, with war in the South China Sea. Right. I think a, an interesting question about this is whether people care about having accurate predictions as much as they say they do. And the Iraq weapons of mass destruction example is is a good example insofar as arguably. I mean, this is very difficult to say for sure, and I can't get inside their head, but some people would claim that Cheney cared less about whether Saddam really had weapons of mass destruction than about whether he could claim they did in order to advance a policy agenda that involved invading Iraq. And yeah. The people, you know, Robin Hansen has started several companies trying to get uh, corporations to use prediction markets to try to arrive at more accurate decision making, say, if Ford wants to predict what their sales are going to be next quarter, you know, they could leverage all the knowledge of their employees to try to get a better estimate than management can come up with on their own. But these are not very popular. And one reason is that internal politics of an organization leads people to try to push their own view, even when the, the, the market or whatever other prediction mechanism, whatever model you're using suggests a, uh, uh, a different answer. So people pretend that they care about wanting the most accurate view, but maybe they only want um, a view that will agree with their preconceptions. Yeah. Can I, can I ask you a question, um, uh, Sam? Sure. So, so with that idea, um, there is in fact um, an animosity um, in in American people, including myself. So. Um, there was this thing where President Bush was like, there is weapons of mass destruction and they went out there and they looked for them and they didn't find them. And there was this this controversy and there was this, uh, you know, uh, sort of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, what is the answer? I mean, do you, do you, do you have, um, in, in your own opinion, and I don't mean to uh, put you on the spot, um, in other words, was there actually weapons of mass destruction discovered, or or, or was it like a Colin Powell um, finally resigned for because because he he realized he was being he was being uh, sort of uh, trolled? Uh, was there or was there not 
Matt, evidence of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. I, I certainly know of no evidence. I thought the point is it, they, it never, they, got, they never, you know. yeah, they never found anything. Um, there was, there was. Well, what happened was a Iraqi defector who used to work within the uh, uh, chemical um, warfare. Uh, Curveball. Yeah. Yeah. He came to the States and said that there was weapons of mass destruction. They were, they did have chemical weapons. They had uh, biologicals. Uh, they were working on a nuclear program. Yeah. There was, there was a news item that surfaced right. sometime before the uh, Iraq war of the yeah. Iraqis gassing uh, Kurds. Yeah, that was before. That was before the. Uh, uh, that was that was during the uh, Iran Iraq War. In the, yeah, in the... there there is some evidence that the Iraqi, the Iraqi army did use chemical weapons, right. in so, in a yeah. in a so, small way, but there there were no weapons of mass destruction found in Iraq. After... Yeah, not a, yeah, not after the uh, the current one, and even in uh, uh, Desert Storm, they never found anything. No. Yeah, well, the point but, the point is that the prediction that the that was delivered to the president was a very poor a quali- very poor quality. Well, yeah. uh, you could say it's a lie, or you could say it was it was. Well, I mean, they were they were, lied they, to they were people they, who, who staked their reputation on it, though. Well, they, they they were lied to, but they took it as when they went to Saddam and says, "Hey, we believe you have weapons of mass destruction. We want to go into these buildings to look." Saddam wouldn't let him do it. Um, Saddam kind of perpetuated the idea that there was weapons because he didn't want to seem weak in the Middle East. Right. That was that was, right. what was he, that was, he was that, making his own prediction about how the U.S. would react, yeah. and he was also very wrong. <laughs> so yeah, so, yeah. Well, that, you know, really Saddam, Saddam may have thought he had those weapons, but his corrupt lieutenants were actually spending the money on something else. Like, I think he awesome. also he misjudged the climate of opinion in the uh, United States after nine eleven. Yeah, there was a lot of there was a lot of miss uh, miss missed opportunities. Uh, but yeah, there was definitely uh, the U.S. was. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, the U.S. was lied to that from this uh, defector that. Um, that there were weapons. But they and, they ever weighted that information that you know. Yeah, but they. They never vetted it. They couldn't vet it. It was all sort, you know. And then it was like, all right, we're going in, you know. And that. And well, that, once you reach a certain point where you you kind of, you have troops on the border and you're you're ready to deploy, it's really hard to say no. Made a mistake. Yeah. Let's back out. Well, that's another <laughs> problem. I don't think anyone wanted to admit to any mistakes. Um, in that, you know, when, when it was realized. Well, that's one of the things that it, Sam was saying, right? That, 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 that the leadership of certain large organizations are not incentivized to admit that they were wrong or to, uh, accept a completely different view of the narrative from what they have already been evangelizing for many years or, you know, uh, so they, they, it's part of the way that we like to tell stories once we have to tell, we don't want to tell a different story. We don't want to change our story. We don't want to admit to being. Well, I like to think of it as being. We're not. We don't like to be admitting to a, if we're wrong. But I think there's also a. There is a, a financial, um, incentive, not to tell the truth, when um, it may cost. The, the, the one story. That it really, it, it, this this thing really bugs me, and it actually it it, it starts off with uh, Illinois and its governor uh, uh, Ryan. He had uh, uh, basically had been getting uh, campaign campaign district uh, contributions from uh, truck driving outfits to uh, help their drivers get CDLs. So there was all these um, they were basically uh, giving handing out CDLs to anybody who. Did the, did this you know did their oh we do that in Maryland test. too yeah <laughs> sorry what what's the, no, just, what, just the next ask. the just, next step but the next step was that uh, one of those drivers killed a family in 
in Milwaukee in a car in a Ford. I think it was a, what's the uh, the, the minivan Ford. Uh, uh, a Ford minivan. Okay, that's good enough. Uh, okay, and it turned out that there was um, a Ford engineer who said all we needed to do was put in a a fifteen cent uh, piece of cardboard between the uh, the temp the the uh, gas sender and uh, this this one part it would it would prevent uh, these a fire from breaking out and that's what killed this this family the person that um, said no that would cost too much it would be cheaper to pay the people we kill and that's what he said this guy said this it would be cheap it would be cheap it would be cheaper to pay the families after we kill them than to replace to have a recall and replace this part. That guy was Ken Starr, the guy that went after Bill Clinton over Monica Lewinsky. You know, the, you know, <laughs> and these guys will never admit. These guys would not admit they were wrong. And for you know, this guy said basically, you know, he was saying, you know, it would be cheaper to kill a family than to put in a fifteen piece, fifteen cent piece of plat, uh, cardboard in this thing. And well, was that accurate or not? It might was, have been a correct prediction. Fifteen cents times how many millions of minivans, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> that's, that's my question. It's like, it's like, is it is it really about that? Is it really about um, admitting that you were wrong about something, um, and to the point where 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 some family is going to be disrupted? I mean, is it really about that? Is it really about admitting that you're wrong? I think right. This raises the question about if you can have the best predictions in the world, it's a question of what you do with that information. So there's this idea, you know, even if you know what's going to happen, you still have to make some political decision about what your actions should be based upon what your predictions tell you you should do. Right. You know. Yeah, and 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 you know, if the heavens had opened above the White House in 2003, and the voice of God had spoken to George Bush. There's no WMDs in Iraq, George. Would he still have gone in? He might very well have, right? I think so. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's, it's a matter. Of, it's a matter of admitting he was wrong. He Say, look, just, Lord, look the other way. I'm going to go kick Saddam's ass. <laughs> well, there's definitely a culture in the United States that it, you can't admit wrong, or because that there's liabilities and it can, it can cost you. I mean. You make an honest mistake, you know, you 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 run it. You run a red light. Well, it's just you the know, cognitive totally. dissonance, right? Once you once you've established this reality, this mythology, it's very hard to to uh, say, "Oh, never mind." <laughs> yeah, we well, can't. Also, yeah, we can't all be able to tell us. It's hard to admit that you're wrong. It's like that, that really that really rubs me the wrong way. Well, it's not just admitting you're wrong. It's admitting that a lot of things are wrong. That the, your whole story you've been telling is wrong. It, it's it's not just you got one fact wrong, right? Um, okay. Well, let let's uh yeah let let's move on to uh, since we've been doing this for uh let's see an hour and. 14 minutes, almost 12 minutes. So uh, uh, I'd like each panelist to give me a prediction. Now, hopefully you've logged your prediction and prediction book. If, But if you haven't, uh, please do that a after the fact. So that we will Did have... you tell the audience about prediction book? I did not because I'm an idiot. Uh, go to predictionbook.com. Now, if you, you can see the predictions there, uh, my username is paul.david.car or let other people tell you what their usernames are. Uh, the uh, I have voted on a bunch of predictions there, uh, and I've made a few. But most of mine have to do with with uh, politics or soccer. But <laughs> uh, oh, there's also, also the one about cultured meat uh, or lab-grown meat. Um, Sam has a good one. Uh, I, I'm going to. Uh, some of them are very near term. Some of them are much less longer term. My my favorite ones are a bit, a few years out. So hopefully you have forgotten about them by the time uh, they come around. But uh, since I have prediction book, you can always check on me, right? So assuming predictionbook.com is still around when I 
and my predictions uh, proved to be completely uh, wildly off base. Um, so uh, let's start with um, with Sam. Okay, uh, my username on prediction book is S F L I C H T. Uh, so my prediction is, takes back to another uh, unseen podcast topic of space stuff, uh, and this is related to billionaire Yuri Milner's recent breakthrough Starshot initiative. And this is the idea of we're going to allow this billionaire to construct a giant array of lasers somewhere in the mountains and have it shoot a solar cell spacecraft at uh, accelerated to zero, uh, 20% of the speed of light and uh, travel to Alpha Centauri in 20 years. At least that's the idea. So far, all he's done is he's donated uh, $100 million for research purposes. And so my prediction is, uh, well, the question I'm asking in my prediction is whether his research program, the Breakthrough Starshot Initiative, will construct a working prototype of a later laser-propelled nanocraft, a small solar sailed solar propelled, uh, sorry, photon propelled spacecraft capable of accelerating to more than 1% of the speed of light before the year 2030. Um, and my estimate of the probability of this was 10%. Okay. And some of the, there's, there's three wagers on that now. And, uh, um, one of them is mine. Uh, uh, the other two are, Yours is ten percent. Mine is forty percent. So I'm a little optimistic, maybe. Uh, and another fellow came in at, or I don't know who that is. Uh, could be a, a lady. Forty-two uh, percent. So forty-two um, percent. Haha, <laughs> I get it. Uh, so <laughs> um, you know, so it, right, so it so, averages out to. Uh... 30% confidence. Okay. I've got, so that's a really interesting prediction. And I think 2030 is about the right time frame. Uh, I, there's a, so many variables there. It's hard to tell. Uh, but, um, uh, Mr. Milner, if you hire me, I will make it more probable. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, Basically with my 10% prediction, I saying, I, I pretty much don't think it's going to happen, but I'm leaving myself enough wiggle room that there's, there's a shot. You know, okay. I could get lucky. Okay. I'm going to, do mine next to give these other folks a little time to get theirs in line. Um, and I actually have lots of predictions on prediction book. Most of them are, uh, almost certainly wrong. Well, should all of them are almost certainly wrong. Uh, you can sort of vote against, if you vote against me, you'll probably do well. Uh, let's see. What's my favorite one. Um, I, I'm going to pick this one. Uh, a confirmed SETI detection of an ET technological civilization uh, by 2028, May 1st. Uh, I put it at uh, 65%, and everybody else came in lower. <laughs> uh, some are as low as 2%. So, uh, no, actually, that, the guy 2% upgraded it to 5%. Uh, this is based upon not only breakthrough initiative funding, but also the, um, the addition of the, what's called the square kilometer array, which is a far more sensitive radio telescope that we've ever had before. Uh, so, and also, uh, the fast, there's also the fast telescope in China that's being built. Yeah. That large. one. Yeah. That, that's like a big RC bow. Uh, and, and I think that possibly by 2028, uh, will he have an even better than the currently predicted uh, square kilometer array? But uh, there, there's actually a very large array update that's that's in the very early planning stages. So uh, essentially, our radio astronomy uh, sensitivity is going to get a lot better over the next decade. And if there's signals out there, uh, we have a better chance of finding them. Not a not. A, no guarantee that we'll find them because we can only cover a very small part of the sky at any one time. But statistically, uh, we have a better chance. So I put it at sixty-five percent. Um, that's my prediction. Uh, what do you guys think? I would say your prediction is is reasonable, but twenty twenty-eight 
I would say is too short a time span. I, I would I would have added at least another ten years onto that. Okay, but to, to g- put, given the twenty twenty eight, what what would you say is the pers- probability is, Adam? Uh, uh, twenty twenty eight. I would say it would be about twenty percent. Okay, that's that's fair. Uh, anybody else want to chime in on that one, or should we move on to the next one? I, I'm going to say I'm going to say that uh, um, I'm I'm finding that I'm siding with Sam. Um, I'm, I'm, I, I find that he he has this uh, sort of almost almost uh, you know uh, uncanny way of of explaining things that that you know I can't say that there's a twenty percent chance or there's a thirty percent chance. I'm going to say that uh, Sam Sam seems to have the uh, the uh, um, understanding that uh, he doesn't want to say any percentage, and I'm going to I'm going to say yeah, I I said five percent. I yeah, he came did, in with five percent. Yeah. yeah, okay, okay, I'll go, I'll, I'm going to go with Sam because I I, I I find that Sam has has his way of of actually of actually uh, trying to avoid the actual. Prediction. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think. I don't think you've actually made a forecast unless you've put a probability on it. I was. I was called. Into, I was called into this podcast uh, unexpectedly. Uh, you know, so I'm. I'm just going to have to side with the person that I, that I agree with the most, and that is Sam. Okay, Paul. I have a question about your 65. percent So yeah. how does that break down between your uh, Drake equation term and your odds of detection, given that they're out there? Well, the Drake so equation has a lot of completely unknown terms in it. Uh, right, but what's your what's your personal best estimate for that there is a technological ET broadcasting signal that we could, in principle, detect? Uh, I think it's uh, well um, based upon my wild guess at what the lifetime of a technological civilization is. Uh, it's it's close to one hundred percent. Okay, so sixty five percent is basically your odds that. That we'll find it. Detection capabilities. Well, yeah. the the problem is, they may not want us to find them, or they may uh, not be at all. They may not be completely indifferent to us finding them. Uh, and essentially, we're more likely to find a civilization that wants to be found. So, um, My far, biggest far problem, more likely. <laughs> the biggest problem I have with with that, Paul, is uh, the the cosmological distance. I I. Do believe that there are technological civilizations out there in the universe, but the the length of time it takes for a signal to travel from their galaxy to our galaxy is such an immense amount of time. Well, th- this would be a civilization within our own galaxy, but uh, yeah, yeah, well, it's a detection. It's just just a one way detection on our part. It's not. Communication. Even even within our galaxy, it could take eight thousand years, or or longer, yeah, or much longer. But for us, but for us. they don't have to still be existing. You just have to detect that they <laughs> exist at one time. That's that's yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. The uh, but um, as Sam pointed out, it does depend upon uh, a lot of assumptions, and uh, so I'm just kind of uh, going on. A little bit of thinking and some reading and some gut feel on yeah. on what essentially I think the only term that really is the wild card here is is L, which is how long a civilization lives, uh, and the other stuff I think is all going to come out to be pretty close to one, and then it's just a question of of does a civilization live a thousand years or a hundred thousand years, uh, and that vast range. Uh, is going to determine whether or not we can detect one. Uh, yeah, I, I had I, I have the same feeling with uh, Sam's prediction. I do believe that we will send probes to Alpha Centauri, but I think it's going to take at least forty years to develop the technology, particularly the the lasers. I'm I'm not a big fan of ground based lasers shooting. Yeah. I think I think I understand that I think I understand the rationale for ground based, but uh, let's talk about that another another episode. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, it. it um, so let's talk about. Oh, by the way, David Grigg came in at one percent on that. Uh, so 
Okay, David, you and I have to have a fight over that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, Adam, your turn. Yeah, uh, I've got a couple. Do you want them both? Yeah, what's your prediction book name, by the way? Adam Smith. Oh, Adam Smith. Capital A, capital S, no spaces. Adam Smith. Uh, oh, okay. All right. Uh, Prediction number one? Yeah. Police officers in the UK will wear webcams equipped with facial recognition software to apprehend criminals by 20, I think I put 2022. And I'm pretty confident about that. I think I put it up as high as 90% Hmm. probability. Now, it, I guess you'd have to ask the question of what, what additional value that would add to their, to their jobs. Right. I mean, well, they, they already use, um, number plate recognition uh-huh. in police cars to, uh, identify illegal drivers. The, the technology already, ex- facial recognition technology already exists. So it's only a matter of time before it's used. I firmly believe that it will happen. It's just the most difficult part of this whole thing, prediction for me, is guessing when. Ah. When will the money be available? That They'll obviously run a, a pilot program at some stage, you know, and then it will be rolled out if it's successful. So you're saying that the police officer will have like a, a cam- camera on his or her uniform that will identify yeah. the person they're looking at. Yep. Yeah. Uh-huh. There, there are a whole range of civil liberties questions to do yes. with that, but the government will uh, disregard those. Here in the U.S., <laughs> we already have quite a number of police officers with cameras uh, just keeping an eye on, on them and their bad behavior. Yeah, sure. <laughs> So-called body it's, cams. <laughs> it's more the, the, the use of facial recognition software that I was right. driving at. Okay. But in the United States, I think that would be a constitutional, potentially a constitutional issue. Yes. Yeah, that's that's why I specified the UK. I'm sure there would be a huge fight over it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, who knows who'll win? I mean, we you know we have problems right now with uh, you know the NSA. Well, well here in the United States, uh, we have a problem with the religious uh, ass wipes. Um, um, trying to trying to inject their their uh, stupidity, so uh, who knows what's going to happen? Okay, well let's not get, let's let's not go there right now, Patrick. I made uh, an, a, <laughs> another one as well. Anyway, uh, I made a different prediction that uh, a supernova explosion will occur in the Milky Way, and will be detected by its neutrino and gravitational wave emissions before optical telescopes spot the supernova explosion okay neutrino and gravitational waves okay yeah uh how common are supernovas in the milky way like i, I have a prediction are, wait wait, wait wait patrick wait wait there are around two every hundred years the trouble yeah. is that if if one is on the other side of the center of the milky way its optical uh emission is dimmed a lot by the dust and the center of the galaxy so it it will be a lot easier to detect neutrinos and gravitational wave emissions and we do sorry you're saying there are two new supernovas every hundred years but each supernova lasts hundreds or even thousands of years right well no the the basic event lasts only a few days. days yeah so then isn't it pretty bold of you to predict a supernova before the year 2025 at all, regardless of whether we can detect it? Well, <laughs> my, I have a dream. <laughs> and that is that I will live to see a supernova explosion. I yeah. see. Well, I remember the so, one in 1987. Uh, that was uh, visible in the Southern Hemisphere. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, not visible to me. Yeah. Um, I want to see a supernova shining in the sky one of these days before I die. 
Well, you're, then it'll, but that won't probably not be detected by gravity waves first, but by it's going to happen. Yeah. No, it will. It will. It, that, well, that is my prediction that it will be detected by a gravitational wave emission. That, 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 that was my that was next emission. statement. Okay. Because because we now have the technology to do that, and it will be a lot easier to spot. And what was the probability you put on that, uh, Adam? Very high. Okay. Uh, I think something like ninety-five percent. Oh, okay. Okay, Patrick, your turn. What's what's your prediction? Um, Date and probability, please. Measure. Must okay, be measurable. So, so, so in, in in the light of of the last uh, few statements that we're talking about the, in the next few years, um, I think that Beetlejuice is is going to explode in in the, and in fact, um, maybe maybe it would be a life changing thing for me. I'm going to be able to see this. I'm going to be able to say, wow, I finally started to see this. Um, you know, <laughs> Mito Juice is like 400, 500, uh, whichever, whichever website you go to and, 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 and they, uh, uh, it is how far away it is. It's four or 500 layers away. But anyways, um, it's going to explode and we're going to see this fucking thing as, as a, as a, as a, uh, uh sort of a, you know, twilight uh, thing, and I'm gonna die before that happens. You know, I'm, I'm gonna die. I'm gonna die when that happens or before it happens. I'm hoping that I can actually see it before I die. So but according you know, to Wikipedia, they're pretty yeah, sure it's it will like, it's like happen I'm within a hundred thousand years. years. I'm 57. Yeah, and within the next within the next fifty years, this is gonna happen. Beetle juice is gonna go supernova. And I would. It's gonna, I it's would gonna be. A, it's gonna be a, an Earth changing <laughs> event. And I'm going to be able to see this just before I die. I would rate that's that. My, that's my prediction. I would rate that at zero, zero probability, Patrick, I'm afraid. It's not going to happen for a few thousand years. Well, it could be. Well, maybe know, Patrick will live a few out. more thousand years, you know. Uh, but Patrick, got to put a date on it. Um, I, I'm, I'm like, I'm 56 years old. I'm going to go on 57. I'm thinking, I'm thinking maybe 30 years from now. So I'll be 80. So 2046. Old. Yeah. Something like that. Okay. So by 2046, what probability? Uh, I'm thinking 45% probability. Okay. I, I like that you're putting a, a second significant digit. Yeah, you know, I'm not. I'm not <laughs> exactly confident about this, but, but Beetlejuice is definitely an honest way of going out. But you know, who the fuck knows? <laughs> I'm going to defer to Adam's estimate and say my own guess is uh, one in a hundred thousand. Yeah. yeah, that's about right. Yeah, in in that in that thirty years, I would say that's pretty close to about right. Yeah. Pretty, I'd say what, 42. Wouldn't it be a beautiful thing? What would would it not be a beautiful thing if we actually Oh, definitely. Started? Definitely it would it would be beautiful. Yeah, a shining beacon in the sky, but it, it simply maybe, isn't. maybe maybe I'm just hoping, I don't know, you know. I'm I'm hoping for it to happen. Eta Karina might just time. beat Beetlejuice to it. But then yeah, uh, I, I'm that... I'm definitely, you know, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to add that. I'm gonna, I'm going to say that I am definitely hoping that it would happen. <laughs> <laughs> I want. I want to see that. I want to see that. So it's, it's, it's six hundred and fifty light years away. So would it be really spectacular, even seen with a naked naked eye? If it yes. Yes, yeah, yes, it would be. It would if be, it happened six hundred and fifty years ago, yeah, it it might have already happened. <laughs> yes, that's true. But it's improbable. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Mike. Mike Bowler, you get you get a shot at a prediction. Uh, I didn't make a prediction, but I kind of. You got to make one anyway, or I'll be very well, angry with you. Gonna, I was just going <laughs> to qualify that I was following this uh, John uh, Paul Carr around, see what he predicted, and see what. Oh, that guy's an I, idiot! Don't don't believe anything you see there. Well, that's that was kind of the thing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but actually, I do like the SpaceX one, uh, an orbital. I heard that they're trying; they're wanting to do a landing, or at least. I heard somewhere that they want to try to actually do a, a soft landing on Mars. Yeah. Uh, within by which, which years. is secretly what they've been practicing with all these landings at, uh, on a barge. Right. So I, I'm, while I'm not, uh, I'm, let's see, what did I give it? Uh, 75%. I think you gave it a 73. 
Well, for which I, one? There were there were two dates. Uh, this one is uh, Orbiter Flyby Mission before twenty twenty one. Yeah, yeah, th- that one. I don't. I, I think the flyby is probably not not going to happen, but the uh, they'll probably try to land. Oh, uh, you think they'll directly do a a surface mission before doing an orbit? Well, if nothing else, they'll just demonstrate landing on the surface. Uh, kind of like the way they've been doing on the barges, except they'll land something and it will have some kind of limited surface uh utility but it's just to demonstrate hey we can get on we can get to mars yeah nasa have agreed to offer them technical assistance which yeah. i assume means that they will allow spacex to use their orbiters for communication yeah right. and so Plus, Just plus for context, I, I posted these on Prediction Book. I gave it. I put two different ones: one for before the year 2019, and one before the year 2021. And this was in response to the, these recent press reports about they were aiming for a 2018 uh, mm. mission. And yeah. my thought was just that Elon Musk is notoriously over optimistic with his. Yeah, timeline. that's true. So, yeah, he's the dates are typically uh, a few years behind reality, uh, so. But I gave it an eighty percent chance for before twenty twenty one. Anyone else want to weigh in that? What about was Mike? That, is that Mike, is that yours? Or... That your prediction? Oh, mine. Uh, yeah, seventy five. Okay. Is this for an orbiter or a landing? Uh, orbit. Uh, I was expecting an orbit to be a prerequisite for a landing mission, but Paul's giving me second thoughts. Well, I, yeah, I don't. I don't think there's a whole lot of. Well, unless they're going to land on. Phobos, which is something that's been kicked around quite a bit lately, which but I don't think Elon's into that. Uh, then yeah, I would think they probably more just go for the landing. Uh, I agree. Uh, if if NASA are, are willing to let them use the uh, Mars Odyssey and well, actually Mars. they they could just probably just use the deep space network. Yeah, uh, they, which they would, but they, they, you could you could buy deep space network time if you're if you're if you ask nicely. If you're Elon Musk, yeah. Sorry, yeah. this is for com- providing uh, communications for the mission. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because so because think SpaceX, SpaceX wouldn't want to operate their own communications. Array. They could. They could. You 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 in could Mars you could orbit. you could you could do that. Uh, however, I think that they would. In the however, long term. NASA's the one that NASA has is way more sophisticated than you could build in that time. I see. I mean, Na- NASA has some really good capabilities there uh because they have but to. it's old right presumably there well it's it's old really but it's, it's been a lot of updates a lot of upgrades uh i mean consider consider what they just did with with new horizons uh <laughs> you know they've got maven as as well which is very recently just being uh, sent to mars point. yeah and, and there are relay satellites in orbit around mars that can uh greatly improve your their data rate, but uh, I don't know that they need a high data rate for what they're doing. Um, yeah, and they could build their own capability. Um, but and, and of course, the technology is out there now that anybody can access. But uh, so you know, you spend the money, you'll get the technology. Uh, you know, every every it's all available all over the world. You know, even uh, you know. Less developed nations have have satellite dishes. So, in fact, when I was in Cairo not very long ago, I noticed one thing. I, the first thing you notice when you get to Cairo is that every building has hundreds of satellite dishes on it. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, that it's, says more about their lack of uh, fiber. <laughs> yeah, well, it's like <laughs> mushrooms sprouting off the top of every apartment building. Uh, you know, all co- all covered with a fine layer of of smog, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, the um, so I think that's all our predictions. So uh, I'll go around one more time uh, and let everybody make a final comment. Uh, obviously, we, we have more to talk about, but we'll get to it at some other, some future episode. So I'll start with uh, Sam. Okay. Well, thanks. This has been a great conversation. I'll just give close with a recommendation for the, the audience that if you want to try uh, doing some prediction markets, a la Tetlock's super forecasting experiment, he has a public uh, 
platform for doing this at gjopen.com. I mean, you can predict, there's several categories of stuff you can forecast. It's not set up as a market, just as a sort of place where you can record your predictions. And if, you're, if you turn out to be a super forecaster, I think he'll, he'll offer you a job. Yeah, I'm not sure he has a ton of money to offer you a job with it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Although the book's doing pretty well, so who knows? Um, I think he's been trying to pitch his services as a consultant. To yeah. Well, you know, he's, uh, he and his wife kind of had this thing going where they are co-experts in this area. So um, how about uh, Adam? This has been a very interesting exercise. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. It's not something that I've known a lot, that I've read a lot about predicting and super forecasting. It's very interesting and it's something that I'll probably look into and uh, maybe make some more predictions in the future. Okay, well, um, I look forward to those. And I think we all will. We'll all look back at our predictions tonight and think what idiots we were. <laughs> well, we, uh, we talked uh, uh, a little bit before the show about the worst predictions. Yeah. Uh, and I was just thinking about some of the predictions I've made myself. Uh, I, I predicted that Pluto would look a lot like uh, Neptune's moon Triton, which was completely wrong. I predicted that the white spots on Ceres were ice. I was wrong. I, th I thought the same thing. <laughs> so, so did I. I thought they were ice. The, the, the predict making predictions is a risky business. You know, nobody's yeah. perfect, but it, it's something that I think is going to get better and become more important in the future. Okay, uh, Patrick. Um, Last I words. Just, I just, I just want to thank whoever it was that invited me to this hangout. Um, um, it was a total surprise to me. Um, I thought that I wasn't going to be part of this hangout tonight because uh, there was a lot of uh, things going on. Anyway, uh, Sam, um, I have to agree with you a lot. So uh, anyway, thank you. Uh, thank, thank you for, uh, thank you, for Paul, for making me part of this hangout. And uh, and this was a bit of a surprise to me that I was actually being able to be part of this hangout because well, I, it was uh, maybe because because James was uh, in the midst of uh, his usual tornado season storms. Oh and, yeah, that's possible. That's uh, possible. No, it's not yeah, possible. It, it, that that's why. <laughs> okay, okay. So I was just I was just like a throwback, you know. Anyway, uh, thank you, thank you for uh, whoever it was that gave me the video call. Um, I just sort of popped in. Um, didn't mean didn't mean to interrupt anybody, but uh, yeah, Sam, I I agree with a lot of stuff you're saying, and uh, and I, I apologize for not having uh, um, um, any major uh, uh, you know um, subject to to talk about. But uh, thank you, thank you all, everything everything for everybody, and uh, um, I'm hoping that I I gave some some kind of a content to this to this okay. hangout. Thank you. Uh, Mike Baller, last words. Okay. Um, well, again, thanks for uh, inviting me in. I I wasn't too engaged with the uh, the topic thread, I, which I know I'm supposed to. Yes, you are. I know you got to be. In, you got to be. But uh, so I and I am signed up on Prediction Book uh, M Bowler sixty two. So if if you want to check out, I've already, like I said, I was following behind uh, Paul's stuff and. Uh, there's some, there was some, I threw some stuff in there, so maybe I'll play with that a little bit more. Um, and I'd like to thank Sam for, uh, uh, again, adding more to my research and it, it helping me move. It's, I'm trying to understand financial and economics and some of the, consp I do a conspiracy podcast and I'm trying to understand some of these um, conspiracies that are related to the finance and economics and stuff like that and uh, it's bewildering uh, when you're where you when you get into economic uh, predictions and stuff like that which a lot of these guys did to do what they you know what they're infamous for so i really do appreciate uh an, another direction for my research so uh and i'd like to thank the listeners for putting up with me <laughs> okay 
Uh, and uh, that's everybody. So uh, just a few last words. If you have any questions, comments, criticisms, cliches, uh, please go to unseenpodcast.com. And you can comment directly on the blog entry for this episode. This will be episode 50. I haven't given it a name yet, but it'll be episode 50. And uh, it'll be out, if you're listening live, this will be out sometime tomorrow. Uh, the, well, it's actually already, almost already tomorrow, most places, it, the 30th of April. And uh, if you have questions that you not getting answered that way, Send an email to unseenpodcast at gmail.com. You can also come over to our listener forum on Google+. Plus. We have one on Reddit. And uh, so there's lots of ways you can make your voice heard. If you want to be on a future panel, send me an email at unseenpodcast at gmail.com, and I will tell you what you need to do to get on the panel. We welcome new panelists. And so... Uh, please, by all means, if if you think that might be something you want to do, even if just once or twice a year, that's fine. Come on over. Uh, we we welcome panelists. And we welcome panelists who don't want to be on all that often. Just uh, you'll you'll get invites every two weeks, and you can decide when you get the invite whether you want to participate or not. Typically, it's a Friday night, but it won't always be Friday night. So. Uh, when I say Friday night, Friday night here in the in the east coast of the U.S. Um, so let me thank my panelists. I know Adam is probably wants to go to bed. <laughs> I'm already in bed, Paul. <laughs> he wants to go to sleep. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, and it's Saturday morning in Hong Kong where Sam is. So, Sam, thank you for joining us tonight. Yeah, thank you. And Adam. Cheers, Paul. And Patrick Festa? He's already gone. And Mike Bowler. Good night, everyone. And uh, we will see you again soon. The next episode will be recorded on the 13th of May. And the topic for that is wide open. So if you have any ideas, please let us know. Uh, On the 20th of May, we will record our Douglas Adams Towel Day special. I have room for one more panelist on that. So if you're interested, even if you're not a regular panelist, you just want to do just want to do the Douglas Adams, that's fine. Uh, send me an email at unseenpodcast at gmail.com and we'll get you on that panel. If you're a Douglas Adams aficionado or ideally a Douglas Adams expert, but you don't have to be. If you're Douglas Adams, I especially want to hear from you uh, because that would change a lot of things right away. Uh, uh, the uh, if you th- just think you're Douglas Adams, don't bother. Um, well, that would be interesting. <laughs> well, yeah, but you know, I, I never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I come across every kind of crazy person in this business. Um, but if you really are Douglas Adams, by all means, uh, you know, with time traveling, whatever it is you're doing, let me know. Uh, the uh, the uh, we are we are now about to issue invitations for the the uh, the next episode, which will be May twenty seventh recording session. So if you want to get on that, uh, let me know, and you can probably still get in on that one. Um, so uh, again, unseenpodcast.com is where you go to find out more information to support us. Go to patreon.com slash unseen podcast on twitter we're at podcast unseen you can follow us there uh pretty much have all the latest information there so uh hope to see you in two weeks and this is paul carr your host and this is the unseen podcast episode 50 see you next time bye